Good morning and welcome to St. Christopher's Online. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter, that is the Sunday after the Ascension. Uh, and this is the second part of our online worship for this week, uh, that is the sermon. I'm going to begin with the collect of the day and then read for us today's gospel lesson. Let us pray. O oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. And now a reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you, have ga whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your word that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The word of the Lord. I want to begin by asking a question. What does God have to do with us? Were it not for the incarnation, for God coming to us in Jesus, it would be presumptuous for us to assume that God has any interest in us or our lives or our world. Despite its plethora of gods, the ancient philosophers eventually came to agree that behind all of the myths and the gods, there was just one true God who was completely and utterly uninterested in human affairs. And not even just uninterested. Um, in fact, according to Aristotle, the one true God was completely unaware even of the world's existence. Aristotle's God was the motionless, unmoved mover, perfectly still and absorbed in the bliss of pure thought, thinking only of itself. Now, Christians do not and cannot finally affirm Aristotle's understanding of God, but certainly we must entertain this question. Why should the God of the whole universe bother with us? Why should we expect God's attention to say nothing of love or care? Now, a growing number of people in our society are, are answering, well, nothing. God has nothing to do with us. We have nothing to do with God. And even those of us who want to answer in the positive and say that we would like for God to, to have something to do with us, we, we hope that God cares for us, we must admit that it is rather strange to have God involved in our lives. Now, we don't like to think about this because it's a blow to our egos, but the truth is that you and I, all of us, might not have existed. The world could have gotten on just fine without us. This is, in fact, what it means to say that we are created, that God created us, that we are not necessary. That we exist is a gift that is not owed to us. God is never in our debt. If God were to take the little that we have, God would not be stealing from us. We are creatures, and the first thing that this means, whatever it does mean, is that we are not God. 
Now, we heard in today's reading something that is quite strange, but this strangeness is our salvation. God, who has no need of us, has involved us in himself and has acted in our favor. Though God is one, God is never alone. We've discussed this. God is fully and utterly expressed. God has expressed himself fully and utterly. And his self-expression is that one whom we know as God the Son, and the one who has expressed himself we know as the Father. And the Father and the Son have one another in the love that is the Holy Spirit. God is never alone, and God lacks nothing, and yet he who lacks nothing has decided to create us, decided to have us. More than that, this triune God who lacks nothing has chosen to involve us in his life. To make us not just creatures, but children. To make us participants in the communion that the Father has with the Son. In today's reading from John's Gospel, we are given permission to eavesdrop on part of a dialogue between the Father and the Son. We listen in on the Son's address to his Father. Jesus' words reveal that in, in him, God has not only come among us, but has pulled us into himself, not abolishing the distinction between God and us, but forever removing any distance between us. Jesus is going back to his Father, to that glory which he had before he made us, but he's not going to leave us abandoned. Jesus asks his Father to protect us in his name so that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Now, the meaning of what Jesus is asking is far from obvious. Jesus says that he has brought to himself disciples who are called from the world, and he specifies that he is not praying for the world, but rather praying for his disciples who have come from the world, who reside in the world, and who need protection from it. Now, Jesus' words may confuse or even trouble us. What is so wrong with the world? The prologue of John's Gospel, John chapter 1, reminds us that Jesus, who is God's self-expression, John calls him God's Word, that Jesus is the one through whom God made the world, and that Jesus came to his own, that is, to his own world, his own creation that he had made. But, says John, his own people did not accept him. Though God did not need the world, he gave the world its very being. He gave it as a gift. But the world chose not to receive itself as a gift, not to receive its life as a gift, but instead to take possession of itself as if it was private property, cutting itself off from the source of its life, and so relegating itself to, to, to be forever passing away, suspended in meaninglessness and division. Yet the gospel tells us Jesus came and some did receive him. John's prologue continues, To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. God comes to the world he made, the world that rejects him. And he comes not just to bring new creation out of death and decay, but to elevate us, his creatures whom he owes nothing, to the status of children. God has expressed himself in his Son, and now he comes to us, his creatures, so that we would be children of the Father with Jesus the Son. Those who receive Jesus are called out of the world by believing in his name. That is to say, we are called out of the world when we believe that he is the one who is from God, the true Son of the Father. And Jesus prays that we who have received him will receive from his Father the protection of his name, and so be made one as he and the Father are one. Jesus' prayer is that it is we who would receive him, who would be made God's very children with him, and that as children we would share in the communion that he has with his Father, being made one with each other. Jesus returns to the glory of his Father and makes of us his disciples stewards of that glory. Being made children of the Father with him, Jesus entrusts communion to us. 
Now let me state this really plainly. You and I have been called to communion with God and called to be witnesses to that communion in the world. Jesus' prayer in John's Gospel accords exactly with another reading that we heard earlier this morning from the book of Acts, in which the disciples, having just heard Jesus tell them that they will be his witnesses in the world, then witness Jesus ascend to the glory of his Father. Jesus, the only Son, comes from the Father to us, and he returns to the glory of his Father not alone, but having won us, the many children, called to be children with him, called to communion with him. And that is who you are. You, yes, you, are one for whom Jesus came into the world so that you would share in his life. Receive him, and so be received by him as a child of his Father, loved no less than the Father loves his own Son. Jesus has been glorified in bringing us into God's very life, and we have received this communion in which we are, we are one, and we do not need to be afraid. We have the protection of his Father's name. And so we are called to be witnesses of God's love in this world, that is populated by people who are hopeless and afraid. In calling us to communion, God has made us stewards of this gift, his very life given for the life of the world. This is our salvation, that God who has no need of us nevertheless has acted on our behalf, raising us up, we who are just fearful creatures, and making us his children. Amen.